I was inspired to do this video after being a guest co-host on the Dinosaur Den with Bill Hurd. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link down below. Uh, Bill and I spent about an hour talking about uh, some vintage uh, test equipment, uh, so uh, I thought it was time to bring out this vintage receiver. This is a Drake Model 2B communications receiver, primarily a, a 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter uh, ham band receiver, but has additional crystal sockets that allow you to tune it in on other bands. I picked this up at a ham fest uh, over the summer. I've yet to power it up because we really need to take a very careful look uh, at the radio inside and out to be sure there aren't any obvious problems before powering uh, it up. And then we're also going to want to bring it up very slowly on a Variac to potentially reform any electrolytic capacitors that might have kind of gotten soft on us here. But before we do that, I thought it would be fun to just take a quick look at the controls on this receiver and then we'll take a look inside and see what this thing looks like. The receiver has a pre-selector. A pre-selector is a bandpass filter that's right at the front end of the receiver to ensure that uh, we reject any signals that are outside of the band of interest that we want to tune in. And this helps prevent receiver overload from, say, maybe a strong signal on 15 meters, you know, affecting our sensitivity on 10 meters, for example. So uh, it really is, allows you to kind of pre-tune a particular band before we go in and tune a particular frequency to listen to a signal. Okay, down here is the band selector to allow us to select which band we want to tune in and listen to. RF gain to control the gain in the receiver. The pass band tuning here allows us to select the final IF uh, bandwidth for 3.6 kilohertz, 2.1 kilohertz, or 500 hertz, depending on the mode that you want to receive. One of those will be appropriate. And then the vernier control here allows us to essentially shift that final IF essentially up or down in frequency to really help eliminate you know, close in adjacent signals. So a really nice feature that uh, was kind of uncommon in receivers of this vintage. AF gain is obviously our volume control and our main uh, tuning knob here. Well, the switches obviously power on and off here. This is the optional uh, crystal calibrator that will allow you to basically generate a signal every 100 kilohertz so that we can kind of line up the dial pointer with a radical line and uh, once you get uh, kind of zero beaded on one of those 100 kilohertz spurs you literally just slide the dial back and forth to line it back up again. And that's kind of how you calibrated the dial on these things. The receive and standby switch is that's when you're using this in a, a station where you've got a, a transmitter. You throw it on standby to mute the receiver while you're transmitting. When you're finished transmitting you put it back on receive. The next switch here selects the fast or slow automatic volume control circuit. Basically it's kind of automatic gain control uh, type of a thing. And again depending on the mode uh, fast or slow would be appropriate. The next switch is a noise limiter, uh, most often used when you're using the diode detector. Uh, the the detect detector type is either selected for diode or product. The diode detection is useful you know, for receiving AM. The product detector is useful when receiving single sideband or CW. And then the beat frequency oscillator, uh, you would turn that on when using the product detector to uh, essentially reinsert the carrier into say a single sideband signal so that you can receive it. So these are our basic controls. Let's take a look inside to see what kind of shape the rece receiver is in and see what we're going to be up against in trying to bring this thing back to life. Right, I've taken the receiver out of the housing so let's take a, a peek around uh, the back here, the top of the chassis to see what's going on. A really neat uh, copper uh, plated chassis which is kind of cool. Uh, receiver is a little bit dirty, a little dusty, kind of a barn find if you will, but it looks complete. Uh, even has here, this is the optional uh, you know, uh, crystal calibrator that was not included in, uh, in all of the receivers, so that was an option. Uh, the, the fuse is here, looks like all the tubes are in place, the dial cord is in place, you know, a little dirty and dusty here. Uh, all of the main crystals for the main uh, ham radio uh, our bands are there. Uh, there are no optional crystals in for bands uh, A through E, so they're not there. But otherwise looks uh, pretty complete. Uh, see the terminal strip here is broken off of the end, but uh, it looks like uh, just the antenna uh, screw is the one that's broken off, but we can always use the, uh, 
the SU239 connector here for the antenna and uh, we don't have the Q multiplier but uh, otherwise uh, from the top here it does look a little dirty but complete so that's good I'm just taking a look from uh, the other side of the chassis here we've got some of the uh, adjustment coils for some of the main ham bands to align the receiver okay I just noticed something here and looking at this that uh, this wire coming up here to this dial light uh, the insulation is all melty off of this thing. It looks like this wire's been cooked. And what I suspect happened is that uh, maybe this uh, the the bulb here or something shorted against the case and uh, maybe just drew a lot of extra current. But this whole wire, the insulation on it, is all kind of melted and in bad shape. So that's definitely going to have to be replaced uh, before we uh, try to power this thing up. Okay, turning the unit uh, up on its side here so we can take a look underneath. Uh, it looks to me that uh, the radio is original. I don't see any real modifications or any changes. It also looks like the original electrolytic capacitors are uh, still in place here. They've not been replaced. So we do have to be very careful in powering this thing up to be sure we don't uh, explode any of those. We'll try bringing it up on a Variac when the time is right. But uh, in looking at this here, I can see the evidence of that same problem that we saw up top. That uh, we look at this wire here, we can see the insulation is kind of melted off it. You can see some of the bare wire uh, hanging out right here. And that wire is coming from, and, and then if we trace that back, it's also melted up here. And this is coming from the filament transformer. So, uh, so this is essentially going to the filaments of each of the tubes. So we've got one here, it's going down to here, and then from there we keep following it and I can kind of keep seeing that same melted wire all the way through. So we're going to have to follow that wire everywhere it went and replace that. Um, get rid of all the, uh, the melted wire to be sure that nothing is shorted against anything before we even attempt to power this thing up. But uh, anyway, other than that, the radio looks like it's in pretty good shape, complete, and not kind of hacked up. So I'm kind of hopeful that we can eventually bring this thing back to life. Well, so I think I'll get busy uh, at least replacing that wire to kind of get started with and do a little more thorough inspection. And then maybe we'll try to bring this thing up on the Variac. But uh, maybe that'll be a topic for you know a follow-on video for this. But uh, So just a little bit of a teaser uh, to take a look at this... Uh, you know, 50 year old receiver and uh, kind of how they made them back then and uh, maybe in some future videos we'll show bring this thing back to life. Uh, thanks again for watching.